It's been compared to Custer's last stand. They beat their shields with their spears. It's the most exciting sound I've ever heard. A small group of men cut off and surrounded by a much larger force of enemy warriors. It was an event that helped to define and shape the fledgling nation of Rhodesia, a country now known as Zimbabwe. In today's episode of Red Coat History, I'm joined by author David Snape to talk about the Shangani Patrol, a battle that took place in December 1893 between the white settlers and the warriors of the Matabele tribe, now more commonly referred to as the Endebele. So I want to try and keep this video pacey and not linger on the details of British colonial expansion in Southern Africa in the late 19th century. To do that subject justice, we'd need whew, a three hour documentary at least. Let's just say that in the early 1890s, a tough band of frontiersmen spurred on by the promise of gold and riches had moved north from the British controlled Cape and began to settle in what they called Rhodesia. Already settled in that area were the Matabele tribe. They're like an offshoot of the Zulu nation, who had also come north from South Africa after their military defeat at the hands of the Boers. What happened next was the inevitable clash of cultures. The Matabele, under their king Lobengula, understandably did not want to compromise their way of life to appease these new white settlers. A military confrontation was inevitable. David Snape is an author who has a new book out on the subject called The Fire of Venture Was In His Veins. He explains to me what the factors were that led to the conflict. The biggest problem that these settlers found was that they were told they must respect the local customs. One of the local customs uh, was that annually Lobengula was expected by his people to nominate which particular local tribe they should attack. And Lovangula had to do it because his, his throne depended on it. Conforming with the, the customs of his people meant that he could hold court. And unfortunately, what that meant was that the Underbeely impies would, would go out into the neighboring countries and attack the natives there, the Mashona in this case, and they would burn down their kraals, they would kill the men, they would uh, capture the cattle, they would take the, the women and the boys, the boys would be uh, inducted into the various impis, and it was a pretty bloody affair, and it happened regularly. Unfortunately, they started to do it very near the Pioneer Column settlements, and of course that frightened them to death. And their response to that was to, to run away from the farms they'd established and go into uh, places like Fort, Fort Victoria and Fort Salisbury. And they were really petrified. Now, Lobangula had given his men the instructions that, um, that they should not touch any of the, the, the white people, but it didn't stop them touching the Mashona servants. And they sort of had this dual morality and you know, we'll leave the, the white settlers alone, but we will kill, we will carry on as our normal behavior, uh, the Mashona peoples. They even sent um, a, a small impi towards um, one of the settlements and they knew that hiding in there was some of the Mashona. And they said to the uh, chap running it, please, can we come in and can we take uh, your Mashona servants out, please. We know you won't like to see what we're going to do to them. So we'll just take them out into the bush and we'll kill them and you won't see the, the nasty stuff. He still wants the Mashona refugees in the fort. This time he says he'll kill them in the bush so as not to pollute the river. Oh. Good thinking, Chief. Mustn't dirty the water. I can take you. The key political figure for the settlers was a man you may have heard of, he's been in one of my films before, Leander Starr Jameson, the inspiration for Kipling's wonderful poem, If. He's often been vilified by modern historians, but he's, he's a complex and interesting character. Was he to blame for the escalation that led to war? There were a number of occasions when actually he bent over backwards not to aggravate the situation. And in fact, Jameson pacified the situation. He didn't uh, punish uh, Lobengula at all. Uh, and he did also prevent 
uh, prospectors crossing the border into uh, Matabili land um, and, and sort of punish them. So he did absolutely everything he could do to keep the peace. Partly because he knew that would interrupt uh, any chance of prospecting, but partly because he knew that if there was a military intervention, that would cost a lot of money. And these raids had actually damaged the status of the British South Africa Company. Share price had fallen. Uh, settlers were saying they were going to go back home because uh, it was too dangerous and so on. So he absolutely did his best. But eventually, uh, in about 1893, with these raids going on, he decided there must be a military invention. A plan to defeat Lobangula was quickly put in place. They made some quite extensive preparations to actually do this. Their plan was to attack Lobangula's uh, capital, which was Bulawayo. And they decided they would set off from the three major settlements, uh, Victoria, Salisbury and Thule, uh, and set up and they would march through the country um, until they capture the capital, capital. The plan actually was we capture the capital and of course we will take Lomangula prisoner. When he's prisoner, then things will end. We'll make him see things in a different light. So, so that's how it sort of started. Uh, there was training, um, quite extensive training. Some of the settlers pretended to be soldiers. They got quite fancy uniforms, but were totally useless as military men. Uh, and the fact that they were all volunteers made command a bit difficult because they, were, they weren't necessarily under military discipline. Because you know, presumably these were kind of tough independent men who wouldn't well, yeah. have taken kindly to following orders necessarily if they didn't agree with them. Absolutely. The only sort of proper military force was the uh, uh, Bekuana police, Bekuana land police. They, they were actually signed up. They were proper, although it says police, they were sort of border patrol people. Two columns advanced into Mashonaland, one from Fort Salisbury and one from Fort Victoria. Their commanders are to play a central role in today's story. The head honcho was uh, Forbes. He was born in Whitchurch in England. He was educated at rugby and commissioned in the 6th in the Skilling Dragoons. So he was a, a genuine military man. Um, and like a lot of the settlers, even right down to the lowest trooper, public school. These were sons of the middle class, perhaps not going to inherit what, what their fathers or families had, who went to South Africa to make a fortune. Yeah. Um, and for, for followers from America, we should probably point out when we say public school, it kind of means the opposite in America. So we're talking absolutely. private school. Yeah, private school. Yes, exactly so. Uh, in 1880, he, at um, uh, the age of 19, he went to Cape Colony. And in 1889, he was made second uh, command of the then created British South Africa Police. It was created then. Uh, an interesting character, um, full of self-doubt, I think, not much conf confidence, not very experienced about fighting natives, and in charge of men who, as you said, were rough, tough, self-confident, educated, thoughtful, outspoken. And, and possibly he was not the right personality to be in charge. But he had the, the regular military background. Alan Wilson, who also was a major, and there you have an interesting friction point. He was born in Scotland. He came from a relatively working class family, so he was out of place. But he uh, was apprenticed to a bank. He was a bank clerk. And to be a bank clerk, you had to have a very good character. And interestingly enough, one of the things that's remarked about him is he didn't drink. And this was at a time when drinking was highly uh, common. It's something you could do in, in the nights. Um, he went to Cape Colony, actually transferred to a branch, a bank branch, but he joined the Cape Mounted Rifles instead. It wasn't adventurous enough to 
sit behind a, a counter. He fought in the Zulu War, uh, the First Boer War, and was promoted a sergeant. So he got practical experience of fighting both native troops and the Boers. So good military experience. Uh, when he was uh, when he was discharged, um, they got a bonus for being discharged. So he set himself up as a, a trader and a gold prospector. Later, he earned uh, a commission in the Basuto Police, and he joined the Bekuan Land Exploration Company as chief inspector. And he was sent as their representative to Fort Victoria. So that's how he became head of the Victoria Column. He was an official in Victoria, but he'd also got this military background, a useful military background. And finally, we come to Commandant Pieter Raff, a really interesting character. He was born in the Orange Free State. Uh, he was only 16 when he fought in a, a Boer dispute in Basuto land. And he took part in a, a storm, storming of a, a stronghold where he was badly wounded. So good experience of, of uh, fighting against the indigenous peoples. In 1878, he uh, joined the Lindenburg Rifles um, and was part of the column sent out to attack the stronghold of, of Chief Sekumi of the Pedi tribe. He also then assisted the uh, British in the Zulu Wars. When those wars was over, he, um, he, he'd already collected a group of native uh, soldiers, hot and tots, as I think they were told at the time. From, and he then later started to be pro-British, he was, wasn't anti-British, and got involved in the First Zulu uh, Boer War. And he was at uh, Pochestrum when it was under siege. And he's, he acted as a sort of liaison between the Boers and, and the British there. But of course, when the town was taken, he was imprisoned and tried as a traitor because the Boers regarded himself as, as one of them. Uh, some of his colleagues uh, were actually executed. He was sentenced to death but reprieved by Kruger. Uh, and that was a very, it was a very interesting retrospective chap who um, had a lot of experience, more experience than Wilson or Forbes. Um, but his position was somewhat ambiguous. They were majors, they were in charge. He was, um, a local, and they tended to be, amongst the, the, the military people, a lack of respect for local people because they hadn't had the Sandhurst training and, and that sort of stuff, Woolwich training. When the two main columns combined, Major Forbes was given overall command for the advance on Bulawayo, Lobangula's capital. The column was well armed with Maxim guns and some small cannon, but it's worth pointing out that the Matabele also had a large number of rifles, including modern breech-loading weapons. These guys weren't just armed with spears and shields. They decided to construct a flying column, a column that would move very quickly, try and capture him. Uh, they felt that he was moving slowly, uh, because he was in wagons, he, he couldn't walk because of the gout. He also had a lot of cattle with him, which was um, a, an indication of his status. So he would take those, and obviously that's going to slow down the progress. And uh, the flying column was actually the genuine Jangani patrol. Um, all three of the column leaders... Forbes, Wilson uh, and Raff were to be part of it. And the column consisted of uh, 90 of the BBP, 60 of a group called the Riff Raff. They, they'd been recruited uh, in, in Johannesburg and Cape Town uh, and were considered to be sort of the dregs. 
uh, hence, hence the RAF, it's not onomatopoeic entirely. Uh, 60 men from the Victoria column. Forbes was going to be in command. They would take four Maxims and a seven pounder. Uh, and the Maxims, they were withdrawn by 10 mules and they were sent to bring Logan Bula back. And they also had 200 native bearers. So it's quite a big, a big patrol. The fly in the ointment was when Jameson, speaking to Forbes, who was in overall command, telling him that he must not take any action, offensive or defensive, without first consulting Raff. Didn't say he had to actually follow Raff's views, but he had to check with him first. The implication is that you must pay attention to this man because he is the, uh, um, he's the really experienced fighter in these circumstances. Now you can see that that's, uh, that's a, a bone of contention. That's already undermined Forbes because if he's got to go and consult somebody who's considered to be an inferior before he does anything, then is he really in command? And he's also got Wilson alongside him, same rank, uh, again, more experienced, already demonstrated at the Battle of Shingali River that he has skills in commanding men in those circumstances that perhaps Forbes, Forbes likes. Because um, at this point, how many, how many <clears throat> Matabele warriors do we think are still out there at this point? Thousands. Right. Thousands. Um, prob prob I don't think anybody's actually calculated it well, but thousands. You're looking at um, a number of impies, and, and they're well organised. It's a military uh, tradition. They know what they're doing, and the commanders know what they're doing. So despite having Bulawayo, their sort of King's Kraal, burnt down, we're yeah. still talking about a legitimate fighting force that is not broken at this point. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There were many um, groups out in the bush. Um, and, of course, the, the bush was very dense and they could stay in there and keep out the way without being spotted. And, and that was one of the issues, that um, they could suddenly appear out of the bush and attack the patrol uh, from any direction. And, in, in fact, while ever the patrol was moving... The, the Maxims and the cannon weren't much use. They had to stop, unload them and get them ready and prepared. And of course, when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand fighting, impies are the best. So if they could actually get into a column, they could wreak a great deal of havoc. The column fought a series of hard-won battles at the Shangani River on the 25th of October and at Bembezi on the 1st of November. The Matabele proved themselves to be suicidally brave, though ultimately outgunned. As the column neared Bulawayo, King Lobangula made a dash for it, keen to escape from the whites. Forbes and his commanders now had to decide what course of action they should take. So he reduced the patrol to 22 men from the Salisbury column, 70 men uh, with Wilson, uh, and 100 men on foot from the Victoria Column. Now, uh, you could see that Wilson now has the largest proportion of men in this, this group. They were much better horsemen, caring for horses, I mean. They were much more rigorous in their discipline. Uh, they were the ones who didn't want to go back. So you could see that that's why Wilson's men uh, was the largest. Uh, Raf was uh, sent with 20 mounted men and the 78 BBP, which is unusual because Raf wasn't actually a proper officer. Uh, but he was in, put in charge of the BPP over the actual Captain Coventry, who was the, the nominal commander. And just, so, to, just to clarify for anyone who missed it, the BPP was the Betu Betuana Police Force, is that right? Yeah. Border Patrol, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they were regulars, if you like. They're as near to regulars as they had it at that time. Um, that made a total of 190 men on horseback and 100 on foot. Now, even with 100 on foot, 
that they're, they're going to be slowed down. Uh, they had four wagons. Two, two of the wagons had their maxim on them, and the other two maxims were drawn by horses. And they also had a Hotchkiss, which is a rapid-fire gun. Forbes actually didn't want to take any wagons because he thought that would slow them down. The, the conditions, the, it was raining a lot, the, it was muddy, the wagons would get stuck. So he, he was reluctant to take them. But he decided he would because they were there. And they also, uh, he also had a mind that if people were wounded, because they did expect uh, battles, they could be put in the wagons and, and carried like that. Uh, they took sufficient supplies for 12 further days. All the rest of the people were sent back to Bulawayo. So now we're really getting into the heart of this story. Things are coming to a head as the scouts begin to find evidence that Lobangula is nearby. By the way, if you're enjoying this story, you might be pleased to know that I've posted the full interview with David over on the Redcoat History podcast. You can find that on any podcasting app. You can also get a discount for his new book by following the links in the description. They continued the search, the patrol, uh, and they came across one of Lobangula's wagons, which had been stuck in the mud and was abandoned, and another uh, tribesman who said he was only 15 miles away now. On the far bank, he got a few warriors, but there was a larger group of people herding his cattle. It was his cattle that were slowing him down. The river was reported to be very low. And travelling further towards it, the patrol set up a camp and Forbes sent Wilson with his best 12 horses. Again, Wilson's men were better look at, at looking after their horses. Uh, and to follow the king's tracks towards the river, where there was probably a crossing point, a drift. Uh, Wilson was to try and find that drift find out how far Lobangula was on the other side and gather any useful information he could. But, and here's the key, but, he must return by nightfall. These instructions were very important. And had Wilson followed them, the tragedy that occurred might not have happened. Now, we've talked about... Uh, the conflict between the three leaders. Wilson had heard a rumour, and it was probably more than a rumour, that Forbes' plan was that when, he, when Wilson came back, reported the whereabouts of Lomangula, he would be left with the wagons and a few other men, while Forbes led the rest of the group across the drift and captured Lomangula. And got all the glory. And got all the glory, exactly. Um, I, think, I think Wilson had heard this because there was a lot of gossip amongst the various commanders. Remember, they're not soldiers. Soldiers might be more competent at keeping secrets, but these were not. And apparently Forbes didn't like Raff a lot because Raff talked to his men and told them everything. Uh, probably wise because uh, they, they were just volunteers, you know, and they were there for the money and they weren't there to get killed. Um, and, and Raf had this rapport. And which, so, which, you know, historically has always been the Boer way of fighting, isn't it? You know, you, yeah. you, you have a democratically yeah. elected, you know, yeah. field cornet who commands yeah. the commando or, exactly. you know. Exactly, exactly so. And Wilson couldn't, uh, sorry, Forbes couldn't quite appreciate this because he was his background was I'm an officer, you're a man. I don't talk to you unless it's to give you an order, um, and that was a problem. So Wilson, therefore, having heard that he must return, wasn't keen. He thought that he could capture Lobangula with the men he had with him, and he set off with twelve men. Now, thinking he might do that. Uh, was a bit foolish with only 12 because they, they would still be massively outnumbered. Uh, there were a number of officers who saw Wilson going and sort of said, where are you going, Alan? And they said, oh, we're going over the, we're going to see if we can find Lobangola. And they said, oh, well, we'll come along. 
We'll come along with you again. You see, the discipline is not that good. And I distinctly said he was to be back before last night, didn't I? You were here? Yes, sir. Bill. Sir? Tell Forbes we've come up against more metabolia than we bargained for. Then we're staying out all night, close to the king. If we're in trouble, we need the maxims. I suggest you bring us up the fourth first light. Right. Forbes was absolutely livid. He was in charge. Here's one of his junior officers telling him what to do. A couple of hours later, two more of Wilson's men come to tell uh, Forbes that he'd found the king's camp. Uh, there'd been a skirmish. Wilson and his men had retreated into the bush uh, and the weather had broken again. It was raining heavily. Uh, they'd found uh, a settlement, a, a camp, and the reason they thought that the Lovangula was there, they didn't see him, was that there was a white horse tethered outside one of the huts. And horses amongst the Endebili were unusual, and therefore it must be somebody of high status. And Wilson uh, was convinced it was Lovangula. So there's, there's the dilemma for Forbes. Wilson is saying, come over and help me capture Lomangula. Forbes is thinking, why didn't, why didn't Wilson come back? And then I could have done it. So what do I do? Uh, when he further questioned the, the messengers that Wilson had sent, they said, he thinks what you're going to do is to bring your maxims, cross the river at the, the drift, and join his small party. Then, with the, the large number, we can actually attack the camp and capture him. However, Forbes was in two minds because he knew that moving the, um, the Maxims with the wagons and so on would make a lot of noise. So it could not be um, an advance, a secret advance. It would be heard by the, the Indabili. And also there was rumors, strong rumors, that there was a large impi behind Forbes approaching him. So he's got the river in front of him. He's got an impi behind him. And he's got Wilson trying to take all the blame. So what does he do? Could he actually send an order with the, to order Wilson to return? That would mean the mission was a failure and it would be his fault because he hadn't gone to support him. Actually, that was what he should have done. But he was frightened of losing face. If he'd have ordered Wilson to come back and Wilson had disobeyed a direct order and tragedy had happened, it would be Wilson's fault. Or Wilson might have obeyed it and then they could return um, because they were running out of food, they'd reached the limits and so on. So what did he do? Probably the worst thing he could do. He decided he would send another small detachment to join Wilson. Now, there's a, a military maxim, isn't it? You don't divide your force in the face of the enemy. But that's what he did. And he, remember, he'd not got very many in the first place. So he split his, now split his thing into three groups. And do we know at this point how Wilson's men are deployed? Are they, are they in some form of lager? Are they just yeah. spread out willy-nilly? What do we oh, know about their formation? They're sort of, uh, they, they are in the bush. But they're just in, they've no wagons. They're just, you know, form a circle, if you like, um, of the 15 men to defend it. They, they tried to find the best defensive position in the bush with the trees as cover and so on. But but that was it. And and I suppose it's obvious that the Indabili were much more used to fighting in the bush than, than Wilson's men. So they're in real, real danger of being overwhelmed. Forbes's men were also soon themselves being attacked. Pinned down, they were impotent to help Wilson as the battle raged. The attack occurred while they were on the move. Uh, so they had to stop, they had to lager as best they could in a, in a hurry and fight off the attack. Uh, the Ndabili were using a very clever technique. They weren't coming out of the bush, they were just firing. Uh, unfortunately, they were not particularly good shots. Apparently, they used to set their sights a bit too high. Same uh, as the Zulus. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they, um, 
they were firing out of the bush and all that uh, Forbes men could see was the puffs of smoke from the rifles. Um, so they really no idea how effective their return fire was. And uh, so they, they, the, the attack stopped. When they got towards the river, they realized it was now very much higher. All that rain that I mentioned, higher up, had caused the river to flood. And it was getting to the stage where it was almost impossible to cross. However, two scouts that had been with uh, Forbes, uh, sorry, been with Wilson, who were really experienced Bushmen, suddenly appeared. They had crossed the river, they'd swum the horses, and they um, approached Forbes. And one of them said, I think I may say that we are the sole survivors of that party. The interesting point for me is, had Wilson retreated to the river, if the two men could cross, some of his men could have crossed as well. But they chose not to. And by the time th there was any doubt in their minds, the river was so uh, uh, fierce that they could not. We need every last round, pass the word. In the end, there were no survivors as to what was happening. But much later, three uh, Underbeely warriors were interviewed for a newspaper column. And they gave us a description of, um, uh, and this may be a romantic description, of how the, the, the 35 men now met their end. They were supposed to sing the national anthem. It's a good Victorian story, this. <laughs> yeah, I'm always wary of stories like that, I have to be honest. Yeah, um, there, there's another uh, version. that The three uh, warriors that were into it were not exactly dead clear. There is some evidence, but it, the evidence comes from them, and they're, they're reflecting on years previously that they were just singing a ribald song it was something rude they were singing, not the national anthem. That sounds a bit more realistic. I, I think, I think, I think so. But this is the painting a Victorian <laughs> picture here, or the, yeah, and and uh, that they did that. And there's also a suggestion that um, Wilson was the last to die. Um, again, I, I don't think that's right. I think it's part of the, mm. the legend. It's it's, it's funny with all these legends, it's always the commanding officer who's the last to die, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. that's right. Um, the description that they gave doesn't actually fit what, what he looked like, but they seem to think he was the man in charge. Um, uh, and uh, there is some, there is also a bit of evidence. When, when the, the bones were reinterred, eventually, um, the reinterred, uh, near to Rhodesgrave. Uh, and when the they were first found, there was a head missing. Um, and they, the, the people who found it, thought that the head had been sent to Lobangula to prove that, you know, they killed the, the commander. Um, however, they all did say, though, all three of them, that they died very bravely. Um, I don't think... I don't want to take anything away from that. I'm sure they did. But there's no alternative. They were being attacked on all sides. Um, you'd fire the rifles to the last bullet, I guess. Um, but generally speaking, they did die bravely. I would say they died needlessly. Because and presumably, I don't know the details, but presumably very similar to the Zulus. I doubt the end of Bele took prisoners. No, no, they didn't. They, they were all wiped out. Um, and I suppose that, that indicates, as you know, the Zulus were, were quite keen to kill people um, and, and release the soul of the person so that they, uh, um, they were not um, guilty of killing a being. You know the story better than I. Mm. Um, but they were, all, uh, they were all wiped out, basically.
With Wilson's force now wiped out, Forbes and the rest of the patrol had no choice but to pull out. They had a very hazardous withdrawal. Uh, well, that actually is what Forbes called it, a withdrawal. Uh, I think it was actually a retreat. Uh, they were being attacked on all sides on a regular basis by the Ndebele, who clearly didn't want to give up fighting. Uh, they'd already had a bit of a victory with Wilson. Let's see if we can finish it off. The survivors, ragged and starving, eventually limped back into Bulawayo. With the patrol unable to find Lobangula, the war soon fizzled out. While it had ended in disaster, the patrol had served its purpose to a degree. The Matabele had suffered terrible casualties. Lobangula had been forced to run and was never heard of again. It was a mystery what happened to him. Matabele land was incorporated into the new nation of Rhodesia and the glorious death of Major Wilson and his band of tough frontiersmen helped to forge the identity of Rhodesia. An identity that was celebrated right up until the end of their nation and the birth of Zimbabwe in 1980. Now I hope to make more videos about Rhodesian history in the future so let me know in the comments if that sounds good. There were even some interesting American characters who fought alongside Major Wilson that deserve a video of their own. You know where I come from? When a man wears feathers in his hair, it always means trouble. Subscribe if you'd like to hear more about those wonderful old characters.